Um, welcome to the STU meeting. Um, hopefully, that's, we usually have a larger turnout than this, but hopefully some people will continue to file into our virtual room here. Um, so um, it's going to be an interesting meeting today. We've got a great guest speaker, Colin Eaglesmith. Um, I'm going to show some new bass data today, and we'll have a um, presentation from Oweha. Um, it should also be good. Um, Anna, can you go through the, the Zoom stuff? Yeah, classic Zoom stuff, even though we're all pros. Um, if your name is like gobbledygook, we <laughs> recommend you rename yourself using the instructions on the slide, just so we can uh, say your actual name if, if you want to contribute. Um, Y'all know where the Zoom controls are at the bottom of your screen. We highly recommend reactions. Um, give us a, you know, happy face emoji or a heart uh, if that's how you're feeling. And then on the next slide, I think, um, feel free to use the chat. I'll be monitoring um, the chat while everyone's presenting and, and can elevate things that come through if that's needed. And then uh, we also want to hear from you. So feel free to, you know, have your cameras on if that's something that you're able to do and are comfortable to do. And um, please raise your hand so we can call on folks and we're not talking over each other except for roll call. That's the fun part. Um, but yeah, when um, you're called on to speak, please turn, uh, unmute yourself. And I don't see anyone on the phone, but just in case, if you are on the phone or you need to use the phone for your audio, use star six to mute and unmute and star nine to raise your hand. And as you all saw, when um, you joined, this meeting is being recorded so we can put it on our website and um, transcripts are enabled and you can use the three dots on the bottom of the more options to turn those off if you do not want them. And I think that's it for logistics. Thank you, Anna. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So at the beginning of each meeting, we just like to um, acknowledge that there are close to 200 tribal nations in the state of California, more than any other state in the United States. And um, we're on tribal lands. And so where um, I am right now is uh, Sacramento. It's the hub of, of this work group, which are the lands of the uh, uh, Nisman, Maidu, and Miwok peoples, and the Putuin and Wintu nations. And we just want to express our deep gratitude for the land that, that we're on. And um, if you don't know what tribal land you're on, this really great site, nativeland.ca, um, is an awesome resource and recommend you check it out. And we'll keep going. All right. Um... So Anna, I'm thinking maybe we do a quicker form of roll call and just have people raise their hands from each group. Does that, does that work? That works for me. Then we can uh, get to Colin more quickly. Colin, yeah. what are your time constraints? Do you need to go right at 940? No, I've got a little bit of flexibility. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, okay, um, so when I call off your group, please raise your hand. This will be good practice. Um, for using the those emoji buttons. So peer review panel. I see okay. your hand, Terry, gotcha. <laughs> um, Chris or Bruce are not on, on the list, Anna? Just I haven't sure. seen them jump okay. in. Okay, US EPA. Oweeha. Thanks, y'all. Moss Landing. Autumn, did Autumn have a conflict? I think she might uh, be coming late, yeah. yeah. And then everyone else is probably in the field. <laughs> yeah. Okay, regional boards, regional board reps. Oh, those hands. I wish that um, 
we can like have our emojis do a wave, you know what I mean? Just yeah. a wave. <laughs> State board. Great. Uh, monitoring council. Nick's not with us today. I don't see him now. Okay. Anybody else? You can raise your hands and then please put your name and affiliation in the chat box. Awesome. Welcome, Great. everyone. Yes, welcome everyone. So without further ado, well, you know, I kind of went through the highlights of the agenda, but uh, we've got a guest speaker, Colin Eaglesmith. Um, we do our, we'll do our usual quick updates after that. Um, then the OEAP presentation on their advisory development plans and priorities. And then I will unveil the 2021 BAS data, Mercury data. Uh, we don't have the, the organics data yet, and then we'll wrap up. So short and sweet meeting. Um, does anybody have any constraints that I should know about? All right. Okay, so um, very happy to have Colin Eaglesmith joining us today to present about some really extensive work that they've done on the Snake River system. And um, Colin's a, an alumnus of the work group formerly known as the BOG, now known as the STU. Um, Colin and Josh Ackerman did a great study about 10 years ago of mercury and in, in wildlife across the state, um, looking at grebes. Um, so it was um, the, the one foray we've had into looking at mercury impacts on aquatic life. Um, and they did an excellent job on that. And um, Colin does uh, a lot of excellent work on mercury in general. So we're really fortunate to have him here today and to, to share about this extensive work that they've done. So thanks, Colin. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Jay, for the introduction. I'm glad to be here. I've been in Oregon for about 10 years now, 12 years, but my heart is still in California. I think always will be. So I, I miss you all. And it's fantastic to be able to present some of this work. Um, let me get my screen share up. So can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. So I'm gonna be talking about, as Jay indicated, um, some work that we've been doing for almost 10 years now in the Hell's Canyon Reservoir Complex um, between the Oregon-Idaho border uh, in, in Idaho uh, on the Snake River. And so this has been a pretty intensive sourcing biogeochemical, um, microbial community composition, and food web biomagnification project that we've been doing working through the system, trying to understand the process of mercury cycling and then and um, and movement through the system, ultimately building a, a model that can be used to look at scenario testing in terms of managing the different reservoirs in that in that area. And um, just to help you all with the sort of the geography of it, this is the Snake River Plain. So here's Oregon on the left and Idaho. Snake River starts up here in the um, in Mon Montana, or actually Wyoming, and moves through a um, really intensive agricultural area with a series of dams along the Snake River. So it's not not unlike sort of some of the systems in California. Heavy heavy agricultural inputs, and the Hell's Canyon complex is along this area here, and it's a series of three stacked dams. So there's Brownlee Reservoir, Oxbow Reservoir, and Hell's Canyon Reservoir. And then the Lower Snake River um, and sort of the, the Hell's Canyon Wild and Scenic River stretch. Um, and so this is the area we've been focusing on um, largely. And what started this project was some work that was done uh, by Idaho Power Company, who's been our partner on this, that, that managed these dams. And they were doing some mercury monitoring and, and found this pattern of, you know, upstream of Brownlee Reservoir, smallmouth bass mercury concentrations are pretty low. They got higher, successively higher within each reservoir, and then dropped pretty dramatically as soon as you got below the Hell's Canyon Reservoir on the Snake River. Um, and so that brought up, they're trying to get a FERC license, and um, there were some temperature TMDL issues that they were dealing with, and some discussion of, of um, 
trying to pump colder water from the hypolimnion or Brownlee down through the rest of the system. And that, that generates some concerns about methylmercury being pushed downstream and their listed uh, bull trout down there. And so um, we've been working with, with Idaho Power and the states and EPA to kind of really understand this issue, what, imp what the impacts might be and what's driving mercury cycling in that system. Um, and are there any, any mitigation tools that they might have available to help, help kind of re reduce concentrations without threatening the, the downstream portion? And then the Nez Perce tribe also, their, their um, lands are, are downstream of the Snake River, or downstream of Hell's Canyon Reservoir, and they rely um, very extensively on fish consumption down there and um, have rights for sturgeon consumption, and they put a moratorium on, on sturgeon consumption because of mercury issues as well. And I feel free to stop me. So Harry, I see you have a question. Those concentrations there are those in muscle or uh, you yeah, mentioned? those are those are muscle. Those Thanks. are average concentrations in like a twelve inch smallmouth bass, or fifteen. I guess fifteen inches would be minimum consumption length. Yeah, and so that sort of drove this question of, of why are fish in the in the complex elevated um, relative to standards, and why do they increase as you move through the reservoir? And so we're looking at two two different directions: the biogeochemistry. Um, is there an elevated internal supply of methylmercury? So is it, is it inputs or there's a um, more efficient conversion to methylmercury through the reservoir? And the other component is the food web component. Um, you know, do you have more efficient bioaccumulation? Uh, is the trophic structure affecting the way mercury moves through the food web or, or, or physiological processes within individual species? And I won't be talking much about the biogeochemistry. I'll be focusing on the food web. Um, but, you know, the quick answer is both of them are important. So for different reasons. And so the, the, the components of this project really are looking at the, the upstream watersheds and um, sources and drivers of mercury inputs, and then methylmercury production and accumulation in the reservoirs themselves, and then bioaccumulation through the food webs, ultimately informing this numeric uh, model that's uh, more or less done. I think there's going to be, be, it'll be rolled out here in the next six, six to 12 months, um, which should cover methylmercury production and biomagnification. And so the, the real brief overview of the, the bio, uh, biogeochemical components of this is, is really it's a seasonal seasonal phenomenon. Um, in the spring, you have nutrients and, and organic matter and mercury that comes in with, with spring flow. And as the, the velocity of the water declines, you have particles that drop, organic particles that drop into the sediment that fuel methylmercury production up high in the reservoir. So this would be Brownlee Reservoir, the uppermost reservoir. Um, and you get a little bit of methylmercury production and accumulation, not very much. The concentrations tend to be pretty low. Um, in the summer, you have stratification in that system that's driven um, largely by, um, by primary production, both input from, of, of algal material from upstream and internal primary production in the system that f provide the organic matter load for the system that, that falls into the metalimnion and then the hypolimnion, obviously, obviously fueling methylmercury production and biomagnification, entry into the food web and biomagnification. That methylmercury gets pushed through the system, through all three reservoirs, so it moves really quickly through the reservoirs. Brownlee is the largest of the three, has by far the most volume, and the other two don't really stratify that much, and there isn't a lot of methylmercury production in the other two reservoirs. It's largely uh, in Brownlee, and it's sort of pushed through the rest of the system. Um, and so we re repeated that work that Idaho Power did um, a number of times looking at, at smallmouth bass just to see if that was an annual phenomenon or something that, that just happened every, every few years, you know, it was kind of a, not a consistent thing. Um, and what we saw, so if you look at above Hell's Canyon Complex, Fish and Brownlee, uh, Oxbow Reservoir, and then Hell's Canyon Reservoir, and then below Hell's Canyon Reservoir, um, but we saw the same pattern of mercury concentrations increasing linearly through that system and then dropping. And in fact, you know, we see this um, threefold increase and um, and then almost a twofold decrease as you as you get below the system. So this is something that was consistent from year to year. We did this in multiple multiple years. So this this pattern really exists in that system. And so then we wanted to look at the at different components of the fish community. We broke out by um, by size. And so these are the smallest size class. Um, fish and sorry, I can't see my slides because of the. There we go. My picture panel was in the way. Um, so the smallest size class fish, um, you see this this pattern of. Uh, I guess these are. I'm sorry. I'm going to minimize this. I still can't see my. Okay. 
All right. So this was the largest size class of fish, 281 millimeters, a medium size class of fish at 210 millimeters this is kind of the median of, of the community. We see smaller increases through the complex, but we still still see this pattern where it declines as you get below Hell's Canyon Dam. And then in the young of year fish, um, we don't see that pattern at all. We just see kind of a fluctuation up and down as you move through the system. So they're following sort of um, different trajectory. Obviously, they're going to be more reflective of short-term pulses and changes in mercury in the, in the system than the older fish that, that have accumulated over, over longer time periods. Um, and so what we have been working on pretty extensively from there is, is really looking throughout the food web of the entire system, all three reservoirs, and identifying the spatial and temporal patterns in the different guilds um, through the system and um, how, how it varies with food web structure. And so just, you know, the first cut is looking at variability in the system from paraphyton. This is in all three um, reservoirs here. Paraphyton, benthic invertebrate, zooplankton, crayfish, which, which are an important source in some of the reservoirs, invertivorous fishes, and piscivorous fishes. So the largest fish in the system. And, you know, you can see there's a lot of variability, a couple orders of magnitude variability. But what really struck us was in the zooplankton in particular, uh, three, order, three orders of magnitude of variation in that system. We had zooplankton that were coming in at a part per million dry weight um, in Brownlee in particular, so really elevated concentrations. Um, and Brownlee is a system that is a really pelagic driven system. It has steep, steep channel or steep sides and, and doesn't have really much littoral zone or benthic development. So zooplankton really fuel that food web, um, as you'll see later, whereas the other two reservoirs are shallower and they have much more littoral zone habitats. Colin, so, there was, oh, yeah. Harry had his hand up, but took it down, I guess. Okay. So so that last slide was across all the reservoirs? Yeah, this is across all three reservoirs. It's just kind of showing the variation through the entire system. Thanks. Yep. I had my hand up um, for the previous slide where you talked about the difference in the size okay. classes of fish yeah. as related to age. And I was thinking, uh, there was also the factor of what those fish are eating, which you got to in the next slide. So right. I, I took my hand down. Okay, good. Hopefully, I'll answer your question as we as we as we move <laughs> to the, the talk here. Um, okay, so yeah, this is variability across the system, and and again, I, I'm highlighting the zooplankton just because um, three orders of magnitude is pretty substantial, um, and these concentrations can be very high, and it's. It's really important in Brownlee, which we kind of think of as the methylmercury engine for this system. It's producing the most of it and then pushing it downstream. And so this is a, a longitudinal sort of schematic of the different um, biotic groups that we've been sampling. Um, and this is kind of an, an average across all years, sort of incorporating time, temporal variability into our model and, and how do things vary with over, over space. So this is Brownlee Reservoir and this is scaled to size. For the reservoir. This is uh, river mile on the x-axis and you're moving from upstream here to downstream. And so this is Brownlee Reservoir, Oxbow Reservoir, and Hell's Canyon Reservoir. Yeah, Hell's Canyon Reservoir. And you can see there's this actual trend of um, decreasing concentrations in paraphyton. Not a lot of paraphyton in Brownlee when it's there. there uh, it just doesn't produce a lot. Much more in the other two reservoirs, but the concentrations are a fair bit lower. Benthic macroinvertebrates, we don't really see much of a, of a spatial pattern, maybe a little bit of a, a tick up here and then, and then decrease. And then more variability in the, in the zooplankton, you'll see that they increase as they get towards the, towards the dam, um, especially in Brownlee. And this is where you tend to get stratification set up as the, the deeper portion of the reservoir um, closer to the dam. And then they, they kind of decrease as you move through Oxbow and then um, kind of hold, hold steady through, through Hell's Canyon. Sometimes we'll get some peaks here at the dam, but but most of the time there's just not a lot of spatial variability through these other two reservoirs. Um, but what they do mimic is the zooplankton and Brownlee will, when there are pulses, when they especially when the reservoir stratifies or they release a big pulse from Brownlee, the concentrations obviously, as you would expect, downstream begin to match what you see just above uh, Brownlee Dam. And then here are the fish concentrations again. These are smallmouth bass. At 100 millimeters, young of year, this was um, you know across all time patterns. We see this not not a linear increase. We do begin to see an increase in the the larger fish, and then of course in the much larger fish, we again see that stepwise increase as you move through the system across all the years that we've we've been doing this work. Colin, did you ever try to look at space within the reservoir, like 
fish caught near nearer to the dam? Yes, and there's not a lot of spatial variability within the reservoir. Um, much more temporal, which would I'll, which I'll, I'll get to. But yeah, if you go above, if you get you know into sort of the riverine zone up here in, in Brownlee, the concentrations tend to be a lot lower. But kind of throughout most of of Brownlee, they they're pretty consistent. So we focused a lot of our early work on Brownlee Reservoir because it was the largest. Um, and you know, we see this pattern of you know, largely methanol production happening in that system and moving downstream. We wanted to look at the food web in that system and then kind of subsequently move to the other, the other reservoirs. And so we focused on zooplankton in Brownlee because they're such an important part of that food web. And there really isn't much benthic habitat that, that's usable um, within the photic zone, especially. So, um, and, and I guess I'll add the reservoir can get drafted by you know, 30 to 100 feet um, on an annual basis. And so you ha have a lot of um, habitat that gets dried down really quickly. So there isn't a lot of time to establish uh, aquatic communities along the shorelines there. And so what we found, we, we kind of divvied up the analysis between the sort of open water thaw wag portion of the reservoir and then coves along the sides of the reservoir, which are much shallower. And we saw that, that the open water areas had about um, two or three times more methylmercury in the zooplankton on average than um, than in the, the cove areas. And the percent methylmercury in those um, zooplankton were also a lot higher, 69% methyl in the thalwag, 56% methyl in the cove. And so when you when we looked more at the thalwag um, zooplankton and we sample over, over time at locations that were either stratified or unstratified, you can see that the concentrations in the stratified portion of the um, thawag were about twice as high as when the water column was mixed. So really tied with with stratification, you get that that um, you know that, that hard stratification and and uh, anoxia and the hypolimnion and, and a really kind of strong, well developed metalimnion where you get suboxic conditions. Uh, and the zooplankton tend to be higher in those areas than in the um, in the mixed zones. And we we did a lot of sort of vertical depth plots and, and, and found that the concentrations in the zooplankton increase as you move down into the water column as well, sort of tied to, to um, hypolimnetic or metalimnetic water. And again, the, the proportion of methylmercury in the zooplankton from the stratified portions is a lot higher than in the, in the, the mixed zones or when the reservoir was not stratified. And so here, actually, here is a plot um, looking at depth. And so these are different river miles. This is the furthest upstream site. And then we're moving downstream here. Um, this is Brownlee Dam, and then this is Hell's Canyon Dam zone. And you can see that as you move through, concentrations are pretty low where it's not stratified. This is the metalimnion here, uh, this orange. And then the hypolimnion, uh, when we could get zooplankton, they're pretty rare um, down here. And you can see that concentrations spike pretty dramatically as you get into the metalimnion portion of the water where there's still oxygen enough for these, these zooplankton to live. Um, and then I think my sense on the hypolimnetic zooplankton is probably those are just dead zooplankton that drifted down through that through that zone and, um, and probably weren't reflective of, of any sort of food resources down there. Um, and you can see some of these concentrations can get pretty high, 300 parts per billion or so. Um, in, during that time period. And so in addition to sort of the, the spatial variability, there's also a lot of temporal variability in that system. And just in, as an example, this is some data from 2017 that is um, pretty consistent with what we see, in, especially in um, years where we get pretty strong stratification. So we have June, sort of spring time period on the top and September on the bottom. And these are zooplankton concentrations to the system. Um, and you can see in June, there's, a, there's an increase um, to Brownlee Dam, and then it decreases and it kind of flatlines through the system. In September, the reservoir, and it's, it hasn't really been that strat stratified for very long in June. In September, it's been stratified for several months now. It hasn't turned over yet. And the concentrations, again, increase as you move towards the dam and then essentially stay elevated through the entire complex, um, both because there's water from Brownlee that's, you know, kind of near the metalamine that's coming out of Brownlee and moving downstream and then zooplankton are moving with it, kind of pushing um, through the system. Coronamid midges um, don't really exhibit much of a, a difference temporarily, so they tend to be pretty consistent um, between seasons uh, and kind of moderately elevated, not too high. Uh, amphipods similarly uh, are pretty pretty consistent between spring and summer, and we see this regularly 
from year to year is, is the concentrations, seasonal concentrations in the benthic and invertebrates and isopods don't vary much, but the zooplankton do, and especially if you think about this on a log scale. Um, and then crayfish um, are pretty elevated, but they also don't vary a whole lot from time to, um, from one time period to another. And then here are the fish concentrations, so large smallmouth bass. Um, again, not, not that different from, from one season to the next. And then um, just to kind of provide a little comparison from time to from these two time periods, you can see these are the same figures just stacked side to side. Um, and the the fish, the benthic invertebrates, amphipods, coronamids, and midges are all pretty consistent, but the zooplankton increased by you know about an order of magnitude between June and September when you look at at you know the end of the system. So if you're looking at at Hell's Canyon Dam here, what those concentrations look like from one uh, one season to the next. So not a lot of temporal variability in the large fish or any of the benthic community members, but a lot of that variation occurring in the zooplankton and really elevated concentrations. And so, um, again, we've been doing this annually from about 2014. And so we, we were looking at seasonal patterns in zooplankton methylmercury through the system. And, and what we tend to see is, is there's a lot of noise. And this is, um, you know, all of our sites combined, so we're accounting for variability due to site in, the, in these model estimates. But essentially, when the reservoir sets up and stratifies, we tend to get these spikes higher in some years than in, the other, than in others, but they tend to spike around stratification for the most part. You can see 2016 and 2017 especially. And then when the reservoir um, destratifies, the concentrations drop pretty dramatically. And then you can see, again, there's the summer-fall increase that we tend to see through the system um, between, between spring and, and, and fall. So when the reservoir stratifies, those concentrations increase. Uh, and so we've been trying to pair these data, these kind of spatial and temporal data with some of the biogeochemical processes and some of the indicators in the reservoirs. And so this slide is looking at, again, zooplankton methylmercury here on the y-axis, and then filtered methylmercury from the water column on the x-axis. And these are waters from different strata in the reservoir. And this was really interesting is, um, so zooplankton that were taken from the full profile, so that's the entire water column, or just the epilimnion, so the top 10 meters of water column here on the, on the left. Um, there's not a really strong correlation between the water concentrations uh, in the epilimnion and zooplankton through the water column or the, or the epilimnion themselves. But as you move down and you start sampling waters deeper in the reservoir, you see that the metalimnion is much more strongly correlated with zooplankton through the entire profile, but especially, and even the epilimnetic zooplankton in that system. And then similarly, as you move into the hypolimnion, um, there's uh, our strongest relationship is hypolimnetic waters correlated with epilimnetic zooplankton. So indicating that the, the methylmercury in the hypolimnion is making its way into that food web um, either um, from hydrologic movement or from biological movement, the zooplankton moving up and down into that system um, and ending up in the epilimnion. But um, not a strong relationship with the surface surface waters at all. It's really the, the deep waters in that system that are driving exposure in Brownlee Reservoir. Uh, and then just trying to understand the importance of zooplankton to the rest of the food web, these are zooplankton methylmercury on the, on the x-axis and smallmouth bass concentrations on the y-axis. Um, and you can see there's some variability here, um, some noise, but concentrations you know, are Pretty, pretty strongly correlated between zooplankton and the young of year smallmouth bass, less than 150 millimeters, and uh, a, a weaker relationship, but still a significant relationship between uh, zo zooplankton concentrations and, small, and 250 millimeter smallmouth bass. And these would be zooplankton sampled at the same time period and location as, as the bass. So, so they really are an important component of the food web, especially in Brownlee Reservoir. Um, and so here is the temporal variability slide um, with fish. So we wanted to do a really high resolution sampling of, of fish concentrations. So we sampled bluegill and smallmouth bass across um, two size classes of each, of each species every two weeks from June 2018 through December 2019. And you can see that as you get towards October 2018 was one of our biggest stratification seasons. As you get into sort of late fall and winter, the concentrations increase dramatically, sevenfold or so. Um, and these are modeled concentrations. And this is an important component, and you'll, as you'll see in the, in the next slide. 
These are size normalized concentrations from the entire size spectra of fish. So from like 100 millimeters up to 300 millimeters, we're adjusting them up to a normalized size. But when you adjust that size, we see a big spike um, in smallmouth bass concentrations that declines rapidly after the reservoir destratifies. We see a similar but less extreme pattern in the bluegill. And then as you move again into 2019, concentrations begin to increase and it actually didn't destratify by the time we sampled here. Um, and the stratification was much less um, extreme and set up for a shorter period of time that year. So we had a much, much higher kind of sort of blockbuster methylmercury year in 2018 in every ma matrix that we sampled. Um, so you see sevenfold increase in smallmouth bass, three and a half fold increase in bluegill in that, that one time period. Um, and this is essentially when the metalimian begins to erode. So we start seeing the, the breakdown of the metalimian and that water starts moving into the, epi the epilimnetic um, waters uh, as well. And then complete lake, lake reservoir turnover here in December and the sort of a time lag um, in these fishes and then concentrations begin to decline. Con? Yeah. So, so basically, the adult fish are showing this sevenfold increase. Well, so that's what what um, that's the next slide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so th this is the broken down by size class. We have smallmouth bass here on the the bottom, bluegill on the top. These are the adult fish in in dark, and then the young of your fish in dotted mm -hmm. lines. And essentially, when the reservoir um, began to sort of we got into the fall time period, the, the large adult fish disappeared and we couldn't sample them. So they were, they went deep essentially as the waters were warm um, and we were unable to capture large adult fish. So that, because we were size adjusting that previous graph, it was driven completely by the fact that we were modeling these 150 millimeter fish up to 300 millimeters. Hmm. So it was a sevenfold increase in the young of your fish um, or maybe not sevenfold, I guess, uh, Five or five fold or so increase in the the young of your fish, um, not so much. We actually see almost a decline in the the larger fish in that system, and then with the the bluegill, we again see this increase through time um, in both the the older fish and and the younger fish increasing from um, kind of fall into the into the winter, and the young fish um, decline after the reservoir turns over, destratification. So when, if you take these figures here, the kind of patterns that you see in those fish and overlay them with the, the zooplankton data, you can see that zooplankton concentrations in the system really pick up around September. And then it takes a little while, but we see the young of your fish begin to reflect this peak, these peak concentrations. These are all different locations in, in the reservoir um, here in, in different colors. The peak concentrations, there's a, a time delay of, of maybe a month or so before these concentrations are picked up in the, in the fishes. And then they, again, begin to decrease um, after the, the elevated zooplankton are pushed through the system and we, we kind of get down to a baseline concentration again. So there's a lot of seasonal variation um, from Brownlee, which corresponds to these increases in, in methylmercury and zooplankton. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into kind of the final portion. This is looking at, at the food webs in those systems and understanding energy flow and, and how those the, the different systems function and who's eating whom. And so these are stable isotope carbon nitrogen biplots. So this is carbon isotopes on the X, nitrogen isotopes on the Y. And these are zooplankton down here um, and then different fish and invertebrate populations. There's mostly fish for Brownlee up here. And essentially nitrogen, for those that don't know, N15 is, is um, an indicator of trophic position. So you have an increase of about 3.4 per mil uh, with each subsequent increase in trophic position. Carbon is, is a good indicator of benthic versus pelagic energy inputs into that system. Usually the benthic signal in, in most lakes and rivers tends to be in the kind of low 20s, high teens. And as I mentioned before, Brownlee doesn't have a really strong littoral food web, and it's actually driven largely by phytoplankton that, that Kind of fall out of the water column and just um, kind of collect on what little benthic zone there is. And so the carbon isotope ratios in Brownlee are pretty similar to what we see in the carbon isotope ratios of, of zooplankton from that system. But the fishes, and um, and I think it's just fish that we had in June, um, that because there wasn't much of a littoral zone for invertebrates to, to colonize, the fish, con the fish uh, carbon isotopes are pretty similar to zooplankton, which suggests that the, the route to which 
food resources are, are getting to those fishes is almost entirely coming from pelagic energy and, and not from a lot of benthic production. In contrast, when you look at Oxbow and Hell's Canyon food webs, um, so this is the, the benthic algae sign signal here in green. So again, you can see that kind of low 20s, high teens here, it's kind of mid teens. And th these are zooplankton again, these are the uh, uh, paraphyte and benthic algae. And the fish kind of fall somewhere in the middle. We have some species like crappie, which are, you know, definitely pelagic, you know, zooplankton foragers largely, especially young of your crappie that, that fall into this um, pelagic zone. But there's much more influence of benthic productivity in, in oxbow, as you can see these, you know, the smallmouth bass and, and the bluegill are kind of sitting in between the, the benthic and pelagic signals. And then as you move down the river further into Hell's Canyon, you have a similar pattern where the fish, benthic invertebrates are much more reflective of the benthic signal than they are of the zooplankton signal. Um, and then also note that these this zooplankton signature, carbon signature is pretty similar through the system. So it's, it's about negative 26 or negative 27 in all three reservoirs. So this kind of suggests that brown, the, the fish in Brownlee, the fish community is much more reliant on food that's coming from pelagic productivity, whereas in Oxbow and Hell's Canyon, there's much more of a mix and, and the fish community is eating benthic invertebrates or benthic derived diet as well as the, the pelagic zone um, individuals. And so kind of the next step was looking at the efficiency of biomagnification through the system. And so with this, we, you know, this is nitrogen 15 on the Y on the X axis indicating trophic position mercury concentration, and this is through the entire food web. So you'd be looking at probably zooplankton, benthic invertebrates here up to your top predator fishes up, uh, um, up here. And um, you know, strong correlation between trophic position and mercury concentrations through the food web, as you would expect, biomagnifies through the system. This TMS here is the trophic magnification slope. So it's basically, basically how steep is this slope? The steeper the slope, the more efficient your biomagnification is. So there tends to be um, you know, more mercury per unit increase in trophic position uh, with a steeper slope. And you can see that Brownlee has the shallowest slope of all three. Oxbow has the steepest slope of all three. So the con mercury concentrations in top predator fish are higher in Oxbow than they are in Brownlee, um, but intermediate um, between uh, with Hell's Canyon. And then you can see in Hell's Canyon, the trophic magnification slope is actually a little bit lower um, than it is in Oxbow. But a really important part is the food web is a lot longer. So you can see there's there are more trophic steps, just the, the span of the x-axis, and I have a figure that shows this coming up, is a, is a lot longer in Hell's Canyon than it, than it is in Oxbow. Um, and Oxbow actually has a longer food web than Brownlee. And so you have kind of more efficient biomagnification as you move down that system, and you have longer food chains in Hell's Canyon and Oxbow than you do Brownlee. And so what does that mean for fish accumulation in these adult fish? Well, here we're looking at bioconcentration factors or bioaccumulation factors um, on the top here. So this is the water concentration or the fish concentration divided by the concentration um, in water. And you can see that that's what's increasing in these large fish as you move down. The water isn't changing all that much through the system. The large fish, their bioconcentration factor is increasing in the largest size classes, but not necessarily the smallest. And the biomagnification factor, so that efficiency of, of biomagnification, this is basically the change from predator to prey, is highest, um, you know, it increases from Brownlee to Oxbow to Hell's Canyon, especially in the larger fish, less so in the intermediate size um, small and bass. And then you don't really see a, a linear increase in the young beer fish. And so then finally, if you look at the relationship between mercury and food chain length, um, you can see we just have three data points because we have three food webs that we're looking at. But Brownlee has the shortest food web um, by about a trophic position and, and the lowest average concentrations. Um, Oxbow has an intermediate food, food chain length, but it has a steeper biomagnification slope than the other two. And you can see the con so the concentrations are intermediate between Brownlee and Hell's Canyon. And then Hell's Canyon has the longest food chain length of the three reservoirs. Um, and so what we think is happening in these systems is essentially by having a um, a more developed littoral zone and littoral predators, you, you actually have much more predator prey dynamics occurring in the littoral zone of, of those systems and a lot more crayfish in those systems that the fishes can, can rely on. And that's effectively stretching the length of the food chain and enhancing the efficiency with which uh, methamercury moves through the system. 
And that is all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Colin. Awesome presentation. Thank Barry. you. Uh, somewhere back in there, uh, you were talking about uh, modeling the concentrations in the larger fish where you had the bluegill and the yeah. bass. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so for other data, like in this slide here, mm -hmm. do you have measured concentrations in the larger fish at uh, other times or... I didn't get the distinction about that we, one where you were talking about modeling uh, here, modeling these uh, concentrations versus measured concentrations. So the, yeah, so these are measured. These are these are basically size adjusted. So they're modeled in that we turned, in, in this figure, if a bass was 200 millimeters, we made it 300, we made its mercury concentration, what it would be if it was 300 millimeters. Um, and the reason that this increase looks, you know, so high for adult, well, if it were adult fish, is that we were mod we only had young of your fish here. So we were measuring 100, 150 millimeter fish, converting their mercury concentrations to as if they were 300 millimeters. In this slide, this is the actual data. So these are small young of your fish that are not modeled. They're all basically the same size. And then these fish are all about 200, 250 millimeters, not modeled. So that increase is the young of year increase through the system. When we, when we normalize everything to a consistent unit, and this actually is a great example of, you wanna be careful when you size standardize and understand what, what the, the data set that you're working with on is. Um, when we look at the actual data, it was driven by young of your fish. And so if we model, if we only have young of your fish here and we use our, our size adjustment model, we, those concentrations get really high. And clearly the adult fish did not increase over this time period. Thanks. Does that clar clarify it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Chad. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. um, I know you said you've been monitoring for 10 years and that 2018, actually based on that last figure, was a blockbuster year. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you saw in terms of year-to-year -year variability. Mm -hmm. And what would the drivers were for that variability? Yeah, and that's um, you know Dave Krabenhoff has been leading a lot of that work, um, and that's really looking at the biogeochemistry and the and sort of the, the reservoir operations, not operations, but function um, during that time period. And so that year to year variability um, is largely driven by um, the degree of of anoxia. In the water column. So basically the, the mass of anoxic water or sort of the amount of stratification, the strength of that stratification, the duration of the stratification. And so if we have stratification setting up early and further up in the reservoir, um, that it does a number of things. One is you have a longer time period for methylmercury production to occur. Um, the system's really productive. And what, what, what we see that happens is as the, the phytoplankton from upstream and that's produced within the reservoir moves down and sort of begins to stagnate in the reservoir, it, it drops into the metallinetic zone and there's a lot of water column methylmercury production that's happening. And so um, essentially, if you have a longer duration stratification time period um, over a larger area, you get greater methylmercury production in that system. And then the basically the water year ahead of that also has an influence because it with, up, with the dam operations, if they're gonna have a big runoff year, they will sometimes draw the reservoir way down to make sure that they can, they can basically um, account for all that water when it, come, when it comes in. And you tend to have different temperatures in the hypolimnion based on how they operate the, um, the, the reservoir level when, when they do a big drawdown. And I think in 2018, the, temperature in the hypolimnion, it was either 2017 or 2018, was maybe four or five degrees higher than it was in any, any other year. It's usually around three or four degrees, and it was up around nine degrees in, in those two years. So, so you have much more microbial activity at that higher temperature as well. So it's, you know, our kind of conceptual model is largely, it's um, organic matter driven decomposition that's occurring in the reservoir that's driving stratification and there's a lot of um, you know 
within water column methylmercury production that's occurring, very little methylmercury production happening in the sediments. And the sediments themselves contribute very little to the total um, mercury load in that system. So during those higher water years coming in on the inflows, I imagine you're getting, did you measure the actual inflow of organic material? And Yeah, so that's, and I, I wish I could speak to that off the top of my head. That would be the, the biogeochemical team. Yeah, okay. Yeah. No, that's helpful. So basically, you're seeing a, a temperature increase due to drawdown combined with a higher inflow and input. Yeah, and then and then combine that with um, you know a lot of productivity that's occurring, primary productivity yep. occurring during the the summer. Great, thank you. Yeah. Terry, um, I have two questions. One is, um, have they looked at what the sources of the, the mercury are? Um, and then the second, since I, this is a, a group effort, how, what are the next steps as far as, are they looking at what are the options for potentially trying to reduce the methylation, especially in brown leaf? Right, great questions. Yeah, so so they, there's been a, a big effort looking at sources. Um, it's you know, the in, incoming methylmercury load and inorganic mercury load is not particularly high. It's largely watershed inputs. Um, you know, there is some mining that occurs a few locations in the watershed, but not a ton. There, um, and the, the isotope ratios, the mercury isotope ratios, if I remember correctly, are reflective more of kind of at background atmospheric deposition than, than anything else. There isn't a, a big point source and there aren't tremendous loads coming into the system so that that production is largely happening in Brownlee and um, and there's not a substantial you know kind of shocking amount of inorganic mercury entering that system um, mm -hmm. in terms of next steps that's sort of where the model development comes in and so that's we're done with our research now we're working where all of us are working on um, writing writing our various components up and over the next year these, this will be coming out in a series of publications um, but the modeling group is now sort of taken over and they uh, they have um, nearly or completely completed the um, the hydrologic model coupled with the methylmercury module production module that's using or dissolved organic carbon um, kind of sulfate temperature um, interactions based on all the field data to to look at you know, what's driving methylmercury production um, from a modeling perspective. And then right now they're they're going to couple that to a food web model, which we're they're working on on connecting the two now. Um, and so then looking at changes in fish community composition, growth rates, bioaccumulation efficiency, things like that to to kind of numerically understand what's what's driving the um, cycling in, in the biota. And then kind of from there, using that model to scenario test. And so we're working really closely with um, Oregon DEQ and EPA. Um, there's currently Oregon DEQ is working on a TMDL for just that can't, um, reservoir complex. So we're working with them quite a bit right now. And then the Nez Perce tribe obviously is very interested in this and they have a, a lot at stake. So we're, we're also working closely with them. Uh, and so the kind of the next steps are to, to take that model and begin sort of scenario testing with the with the numeric model to see um, what can be done upstream or within reservoir to um, to reduce methylmercury production. And you know, so I think things like if there are ways to reduce the extent magnitude of hypolimnetic water would be one. If there are you know nutrient reduction activities upstream that would reduce the amount of organic matter coming into that system as as um, organic carbon like phytoplankton, that might limit the sort of degree and amount of stratification that occurs. Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, thank you very much, Colin. Really appreciate you, you joining us today and presenting. You, you answered one of my questions about, you know, where can we look for more information? Papers will be coming out. In the meantime, is, do you have a website or anything that uh, where we could get information about the study? We don't, um, you know, we can, I would say it's, it's a lot of work to kind of reach out to each, each of the, the yeah, different yeah. Um, members. What I can do is, is we've got meetings regularly with the team. I can talk to them and, and see what we can put together as, to share. You know, we always have those sort of preliminary data sharing yeah. issues with USGS. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's coming up. But there is going to be a sort of um, key processes report that Idaho Power is leading. 
that's taking a lot of the sort of key findings that, that are coming out of this in a higher kind of higher level, more digestible fashion that isn't quite as technical as what we're going to be producing. And then that should be coming out and will be publicly available in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, certainly reaching out to Oregon DEQ um, as they're working on it. They don't have a lot of the detailed knowledge of the study. Um, and then, you know, I think anyone on the team would be happy to come and, and talk about the other components. I know Dave would, right. would, would be glad to give a talk on the biogeochemical aspects of it. Right, which, you know, this is just one one part of the overall project. There's a lot more to it. Well, mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you don't have to go out of your way to get us stuff, but, you know, yeah. but count as interested when yeah. things are available. Okay, great. Well, hey, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the, the work and, and don't hesitate to reach out to me um, if you have any questions. Great. It was nice having you back in the bog stew. <laughs> yeah, it was good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Colin. All right, take care. Do. Brady. All right. Well, that went a little over, but um, I think it was okay to do that. But <clears throat> maybe we can go a little quicker in the quick updates. Um, so let's let's jump into that. Um, so this first item we keep on here for completeness, the 2020 coast data. Nothing's changed on that. We're planning on reporting that in 2025 after we complete the coast survey. Um, Anna, I'll let you take the next bullet or maybe the next few. <laughs> Sure, and Autumn, feel free to, to jump in. Um, for all of the 2022 um, monitoring projects, which are the three bullets here, all of the mercury data has been reported and um, the organic samples are, we're working on shipping them. Um, and I know region nine is still, I think planning on collecting lobster samples, but weather's been, uh, inconvenient, uh, if, if that's a correct summary of that. But um, I think that's it for that. But Chad and Autumn, feel free to jump in and, and add more. I'll just jump in and say that um, all of the organic samples were shipped and I got confirmation that they were received. So that is, that is excellent news. That's great. great. Um, I can do the next one. Um, so we have started sampling. So, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. <laughs> I didn't want to talk over someone. So um, I am still working on getting the organics kind of working with um, access. We really haven't gotten um, BDDs that are usable yet. I feel like it's close, but it's still a lot of back and forth to get those files so that they are usable. So I'm, I feel like at least with the PCBs, I can see the end, um, but then I'll have to like start working on the other data types. Um, so that's all I had to say about that. I just figured it would be something that you guys would wanna know. Yes, and that'll, we'll, that'll come up again when I talk about the 2021 report. Um, so the sampling for this year has started on started on April 3rd. Uh, the sampling team is sending out the summaries like they've been doing over the years. And um, so hopefully you get that's going out to the broad email list. So hopefully you got that. Um, and I think I don't are any of the sampling team on the call? Are they all out sampling? Every everybody's out sampling, I think. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you anything to add on that, Autumn? No, I don't think so at this point. It's pretty yeah. straightforward thus far. Yep. Yeah. Okay, next one for you, Anna. Yeah, I'll do the next two. Yeah. So at our last couple of meetings, we've been talking about um, kind of preparing for next year's discussion on long-term priorities. 
And last time we, we kind of reviewed a template document that folks at the water boards can use to kind of like get the juices going <laughs> um, to prepare for, for next year. So that template is available and there are links in the slides and the agenda. And we also talked about a more generalized template for our tribal government partners, um, our agency partners and other NGOs that wanna um, participate in the conversation next year. So those are available. You just need to download a copy and um, put in your information. Feel free to you know, make it your own, but that way everyone has a consistent um, structure to start with. So those are available and um, I'll be reminding y'all about them at every meeting this year. So uh, yeah, Harry. Well, just a question about uh, <clears throat> the sampling of lakes that has happened in recent years. Some were not sampleable because there was no water or low water or things like that. And I wondered if there was any need to consider going to any of those that couldn't be sampled before, if there's water now, or if um, they just filled and the fish that are there would not be representative of what the lake conditions would normally be like, but they might be representative of what people would be catching in 2023 or 2024, et cetera. So just a question about that. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, we, we keep track of that and where possible, um, like we keep track of the lakes that we weren't able to sample in the prior round or two. And um, where possible, we try to get them, you know, the next time around. Um, often they continue to have, you know, access issues or issues like you mentioned where, you know, sometimes there's a, a drawdown for one reason or another and the, um, the you know, the fish population is, is knocked back and it's not really ready to be sampled again yet. So we do keep track of all that and try to try to get back to the ones that we missed where, where it's possible. Thanks. And I just noticed a typo, it's panel five that we're sampling now in that first bullet. I'm stuck on panel four, Jay, I can't help, it. Can't <laughs> me, help myself. Me too. Um, so for the just quick update on the realignment and tribal engagement, they're still ongoing. Um, we have a San Diego uh, advisory committee meeting scheduled for June. It's gonna be in person, which is really exciting. Um, and then I'm working with the um, San Francisco region tribal coordinator and team to kind of prepare for the San Francisco realignment starting in 2024. Um, and I'll be, you know, kicking up statewide tribal engagement again um, in the coming months. I know that um, I don't want to pester tribes too much. So I think instead of sending out um, letters, uh, my method will be, um, you know, presenting in, in tribal spaces and, and doing that. So I'm not cluttering people's uh, literal inbox. Um, yeah, so that's that's what's going on for, for the realignment and tribal engagement. Okay. Um, we'll hear more about advisories from OEHA, but there are, are new advisories that are listed here, including Pyramid Lake. And it just so happened that I passed uh, passed Pyramid Lake on I-5 in February and visited the visitor center, which I, it's pretty, I, I just ran through there pretty fast to get some photos, but it's a nice visitor center. So I recommend checking it out if you get a chance. Um, so that's where this photo came from. Um, and uh, does any, can anybody speak to TMDL updates? I think usually Lauren is our go-to person and I don't see her with us. Right, okay. We'll, we'll get her next time. <clears throat> Monitoring council update. I think Nick did join, didn't he? Yes, he snuck in. 
I I did join. Thanks, Jay. Um, the only real update is that uh, we have a June first council meeting coming up. It's all virtual, and it'll be focused on uh, groundwater uh, water quality monitoring. So doesn't really apply to this group as much. Um, but it's really the first time the council has looked at something outside of surface water. So a couple of the council members uh, piqued some interest on that. So that'll be the topic of that particular meeting. Uh, we're still plugging along on the, the web page updates. And as the superstar has completed uh, the mock-up for this particular work group, and we had a meeting last week um, to kind of go over and refine that a bit. And she even got that in before her vacation. So um, I think you guys will be up first as far as kind of getting a beta version up there as I kind of get the use you guys and your guinea pig template as to get the other work groups motivated. There's a couple of other work groups that have um, finished a version, including the environmental flows and some other ones that are working on it actively. So more to come on that. Uh, that I think the process is going to be a little bit slower than we had hoped, but um, that is what it is. That's kind of our, that's where we're at. Uh, I think you know, another guess, another good thing is that we're looking to, we added, a couple of the council members retired or and or left. Um, so the new council member for public health will be Andrew um, Chu. And then um, for agriculture, it's Mark Cady. And we are finalizing the replacement for Mark Gold as the co-chair with um, uh, Jen Eckerly, who's the, the new executive director for the OPC. So um, that'll reestablish that connection, which will be good. And hopefully that'll come out in the beginning part of the June 1st meeting. Great, thanks, Nick. The um, mention of PFAS here in the bullet uh, reminds me of another update from uh, from the Bay RMP. Uh, we have some new PFAS fish data that um, is actually being presented at the RMP Emerging Contaminant Workgroup meeting, which is going on right now, and that, that'll be presented in this afternoon. But um, I think it'll it, by by the next um, stew meeting we'll be ready to share that with the stew, so the latest PFAS data from from the bay. Okay, next one, Anna. Well, the first part is for for you. Yeah, so I just um, I've been registered to this US EPA Fish and Shellfish Program newsletter. They come out uh, quarterly, and it's just a good resource. I usually review it and add, you know, literature that's relevant to the California work to our um, literature webpage, but um, I found it useful, so I just wanted to share the resource, um, and those are links to the recent newsletter and the newsletter archive, so if that's something that you want in your inbox, there you go. I agree. It's uh, use useful. It's something I'd check out, and it's a nice compilation of the latest um, publications and resources from across the U.S., fish advisories and things. So it's worth checking out. Um, and then the last update, I don't think Susan is on the call. Is that correct? No, she wasn't able to make it today. Okay. Well, um, Susan Clazing is retiring. I don't know if everybody's heard about that yet. Um, so she's not here, so I can't embarrass her in person. But for the record, um, She's been a great partner for the BOG and Stu. Um, it seems like her predecessor, Bob Broadberg, just retired not that long ago, but I'm sure it's been it's been longer than I think. I think about um, seven years, maybe. Yeah, time. Before time I say time. <laughs> uh, but Susan's done a fantastic job and uh, the advisories have been, been getting churned out um, faster than ever in the last seven years, and um, she's been a pleasure to work with. So we'll let the record show that. Um, and um, uh, Lori and OEI folks, maybe you can pass pass along that uh, we were very appreciative of Susan effort, Susan's efforts and congratulate her on her, her career and retirement. Thank you so much. Yeah, she did want me to express her appreciation for this group and all the work that you all do. And she was very disappointed to not be able to attend today. Um, 
to express that herself and say her goodbyes. But I will pass along your sentiments to her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to highlight, we've kind of mentioned it once. Um, and y'all, if you're signed up to the email list, you received a couple of emails about our new email system. So um, there's really nothing that will impact your receipt of emails. I just wanted to highlight that, um, for example, in previous years, we used to get emails directly from Gary with fish updates um, during monitoring, but now like those, all, all the communications um, will have to come through me um, just because I have access to the new system. So if folks want to share things with the group, just shoot me an email and I can help distribute things as quickly as uh, possible. Uh, but yeah, there shouldn't be any impact on your end or if you share information with folks and have them sign up, it's still, I think it's actually easier to, to sign up than it was before. So um, I just wanted to flag that for folks. Um, so, you know. Great. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? And I don't have the agenda handy. I think we're uh, we're about 10 minutes behind, but okay, well, that's, that's pretty okay. good. Yeah. All right. So our next item is um, uh, we have talking about their plans for advisory development. Um, I presume you want to share your screen. I will. Yeah. Okay. There we go. And then, um, Lori, can you tell us about the uh, what's going to be the new org chart in the fish fish group? Well, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Spoilers, Jay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. So her last week is actually next week, and. Shortly thereafter, we'll have a um, some acting section chiefs put into place until we find our permanent person. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. The next person above Susan is Elaine Kahn, so um, reviews will be going through her in the interim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, and we're happy to have you uh, to present today. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. I'll go ahead and get started. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thanks for having me on the agenda today um, to talk about our water body prioritization process and our 2023 list. Um, I'm Lauren Chumney. My email says Lori. I will happily respond to either. I'm a senior environmental scientist at OEHA. I do this project annually and happy to answer any questions at the end and would really love to hear any feedback you may have on our process as well as our um, final list which I will show you at the end. Uh, see there. So I'm just going to walk you through kind of how we get to our final list. Um, in order to identify water bodies with sufficient data to develop or update an advisory, OEHA conducts our annual download of all mercury and PCB data available in Steven. Mercury and PCBs are the most common fish tissue contaminants in California that typically result in the most restrictive advice for a species, so we focus on those. Uh, other analytes that we use in fish advisories would have a minimal impact on how water bodies are prioritized, so they are not included in this analysis. Um, we also evaluate data from other sources that are not in CDEN and include them if they meet our data quality criteria. And for this exercise, only freshwater species and locations are included. Also, only fish that meet CDFW's minimum legal size to take or our minimal, uh, minimum edible sizes are included. And these fish are also only used if they were analyzed as fillets. Uh, fish analyzed as whole bodies are not kept because bones and other organs uh, impact the concentrations of mercury and PCBs. Uh, the exceptions are small fish that do not grow large, such as silver sides or red shiner, um, and do not have an established minimum size. We do now include these species in our advisories, 
Uh, our practice now is to include all species for which we have adequate data. Um, and these small fish are kept at all sizes and are analyzed as whole bodies since they are generally too small to be filleted. And once we have all the usable data collected, we refine the data set in a few ways. Uh, some data sets often do not have total lengths reported in CDEN, so these data get added back in if we have access to those lengths. Uh, we convert any fork lengths to total lengths, and members of a species group, such as black bass or sunfish, um, which typically have similar contaminant levels, are grouped as one species. Any samples that are reported in dry weights are converted to wet weights and any duplicate records are deleted and PCBs that were analyzed prior to 2000 are removed since analytical methods have uh, since updated. <clears throat> and then next we go through the data and determine if the station is located in a lake or reservoir or in flowing waters. We consolidate the station names. Um, I can see then you may have Lake Crowley and Crowley Lake. So we consolidate those into one name. A spatial analysis is done on GIS to ensure that all the stations are assigned to the correct water body. So, for example, we may come across a station name such as Willow Creek Arm, which would need to be relabeled as Lake Natoma. And if a station is in flowing waters, do we group them into rivers or creeks or areas of the delta as appropriate? And then last, we assign each station to its corresponding water board region and county. <clears throat> so after we have a complete data set of all of our usable data, we calculate the weighted average and sum the total number of fish for each species or species group um, by water body for both mercury and PCBs. And that gives us a list of all the water bodies for which there are data, all species sampled within it, along with the sample sizes and the mercury and PCB concentrations. And with that list, we'll look at water bodies without advisories to determine which of them have data for three or more species, um, ideally more, with at least nine individuals per species or species group. And for water bodies with advisories, we'll look at the data compared to the current advice to determine if we could add a species or if there would be a change in advice due to concentrations um, from or changes in concentrations from newer data. And to prioritize water bodies, we apply a scoring scheme to each water body with sufficient data for a new advisory based on four criteria. We'll look at the contamination score, the Kalenviro screen score. Uh, we give it a distance score of which rivers are not included, and then a number of species score. So each score category is assigned a priority color that corresponds to a numerical value. So low or green equals no points, medium or yellow is given one point, and red or high is given two points. And then the sum of the four individual categories uh, results in a total score that ranks each water body for prioritization. Um, the total scores uh, range from zero to eight for discrete water bodies and zero to six for rivers with higher scores indicating a higher priority for um, advisory development. So Lauren, what were the other two criteria? You said distance and uh, number of species. Number of yeah. species. So I'll go through I'll go okay. through all of them. I see. Um, okay. Yeah, the first criteria used to prioritize is contaminants in fish. So water bodies are assigned a contamination score based on the weighted average of fish tissue contaminants. Um, again, we focus on mercury and PCBs, again, because they are the most common fish tissue contaminants that result in the most restrictive advice. So water bodies that have a fish species with a weighted average of more than or equal to 440 parts per billion in a non-black bass species, or PCBs that are more than or equal to 120 parts per billion are ranked as high and given two points. And these are the levels which correspond to do not consume advice for the sensitive population. <clears throat> um, 
for lakes and reservoirs, if only black bass species exceed that do not consume mercury threshold for the sensitive population, again, uh, 440 parts per billion, the water body is assigned as low or green because the statewide advisory for lakes and reservoirs already recommends that this is um, the population group do not consume black bass species. So that's already, already the default advice. And so there's no need to prioritize those water bodies higher. Uh, water bodies that have a fish species with a weighted average of between 400 and 439 for mercury um, or 43 to 119 for PCBs are ranked as medium and given one point. And water bodies that have a species with a weighted average of 399 parts per billion or less for mercury and 42 parts per billion or less for PCBs are ranked as low and given zero points. Um, the second criteria is the Calenviro screen or CES score, and that's the score of the area the water body is in. So OEHA uses the CES tool to incorporate the population characteristics and pollution burden that an area may experience into the prioritization process. Uh, the water body of interest is located on the CES map and any census tracts that encompass the water body are identified. Um, the CES percentiles of any tracts are compared to the score categories that you see there <clears throat> to assign the score. And if the water body spans more than one census tract with differing CES percentiles, the higher value is used. Um, and CES percentiles of neighboring census tracts may also be taken into consideration if the particular census tract encompassing the water body is not representative of the greater area. And then also for rivers, which may cover several census tracts, the CES score that corresponds to the majority of the river run within those advisory um, boundaries are used. All right, so the third criteria used to prioritize um, is the distance to another advisory water body. So distance scores are applied to lakes and reservoirs based on the estimated driving travel time in hours from the water body of interest to the nearest lake within a WEHA advisory. So water bodies with do not consume advice for all species are not included in this calculation. Um, because the intention of this category is to provide fishers with regional alternatives. And again, rivers are excluded from the distance criteria because they can extend over larger distances in comparison to lakes and reservoirs. Um, so the score for rivers is capped at six. And then lastly, we look at the number of species that could be included in the advisory. Um, again, most water bodies that meet the initial criteria for a new or updated advisory have data sufficient to develop advice for at least three species. Um, however, if the third species is a less popular species, um, such as a bait fish, it's uh, ranked as a low priority. Um, trout lakes, which may have a limited number of species, are assigned as high priority. So they are ranked equally to water bodies that have three or more species. All right. And here you can see the number of water bodies by the score criteria. So this year we have a total number of 44 water bodies that have sufficient data to develop a new advisory. Um, as you can see at the top, uh, for the tissue contamination level, uh, most water bodies are ranked as low priority. Uh, the water bodies ranked by CES scores are pretty evenly divided between low, medium, and high priorities. Uh, for proximity to another lake, you'll see that um, the most potential advisory water bodies are within about an hour of another advisory lake. Uh, only three have more than a two-hour drive time. And the number of water bodies with three popular species that could be included in an advisory or a trout lake um, are evenly split with water bodies that have a bait fish for the third species. And at the bottom, you can also see the number of water bodies by priority score by uh, regional water board. 
Um, at the very bottom in gray, you'll see the total number of water bodies where advisories could be developed along with their priority score. So as you can see, according to our score criteria, almost all water bodies are ranked as low or medium priorities with only one water body currently ranked as high priority. So without further ado, <laughs> um, here is our 2023 list of all water bodies that are eligible for advisory development along with their rankings. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you look at this is we do uh, occasionally find water bodies on our list that are not suitable for development um, upon further site-specific uh, investigation. We've eliminated some water bodies from our list previously for things like lakes being drained and remediated, or more commonly, we find out that fishing is not allowed. Um, and it's possible that some of the water bodies on this list may have um, some extenuating circumstances as well that would remove them from consideration. So if you see any of those on this water body, um, please do let me know. And I'll come back to this list in just a second. I just want to finish by showing you what is currently in our queue. Um, so the San Francisco Bay Advisory update will be released today. Uh, we also have the Glenmore Lake, which is at the Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area, and Sunbeam Lake Advisories in review, and they're next in line for publication. Uh, we also have Lake Cuyamaca, South Lake, and Lake Hodges in the beginning phases of preparation. And so in addition to the standardized criteria I've just reviewed with you, um, we do also consider other factors in our process on a more ad hoc basis, such as stakeholder requests, um, or sometimes when advice is expected to be significantly different relative to that in the statewide advisory or in nearby site-specific advisories, we may prioritize those. Um, so while these three are next in the queue, based on last year's priority list, several water bodies were added this year um, due to newer data, including El Capitan Lake in Region 9, which has the highest score of all the water bodies on the list. So some shuffling could occur. Um, and with that in mind, we'd like to just use this time to listen and take note of any comments you may have on our list. So. I will go back to the list and um, yeah, open the floor for any comments, questions, thoughts. Harry, it looks like you had your hand up first. Go ahead. I have a question about the logic on the criterion about driving distance. Sure. Uh, the score was low. If it, uh, if it let me was, go back. There you go. Yeah, so if in less than an hour you can go fish at another lake that has an advisory on it, uh huh. It gets a higher score if you have to drive longer. It seems to me like that would be reversed. Yeah. Like um, if you're if you're close to another lake, it seems like yeah. Have if a, there's lots of advisories in the area, then you get a lower priority because you have many options that are located near you within an hour's drive. Is is our thinking on that? Um, if you have to drive really far to get to an advisory water body, that means there's not a lot of advisories in your area. Then we want to prioritize that area. So. Um, people can have an understanding of kind of what's going on, what their options are um, regionally. Uh, okay, I, I get it now. Thanks. Yeah. 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 The ad advisory, having an advisory in place is not necessarily a, a bad sign. Right. Um, yeah, sometimes we do prioritize, um, you know, less contaminated water bodies too, if they're in an area where we have really high contaminants, but we do have one clean water body, we may prioritize that one to give people more options too. So we've done that in the past as well. Uh, Terry? Um, yes, could you go back to the slide with the regions? Yep. This one? 
Uh, no, the, the next one where you show the actual, yeah. Um, okay. Just for my region, Lake Casitas is in Ventura County, which is in uh, region four. Lake what? Lake Casitas is in Ventura County in region four. And the San Diego River is in Region 9 in San Diego. So we only have Lake oh, Emmett is the only one. So those are incorrect. San Diego River, Region 9, yep. And then what was the other one, Lake Casitas? Yes, that's in Ventura County in Region 4. Okay. Thank you. And, and the Santa Ana River is in Region <laughs> 8, not Region 3. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So these can be updated, of course. Um, if you have any comments on the water bodies, too, um, you know, we'd love to hear those also. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thank you. And yeah, Emily. Hi. Yeah, I'm in region four. So I was looking at the list. I can talk with staff more um, in my office about some of these water bodies specifically, but um, just a quick look. I don't think Lake Clementine is in our region. Okay. I think that's Auburn or somewhere. In Northern I think five. somewhere. Yeah. Region five, maybe Northern California. It's, re it's region five. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. I, I thought so. I was like, why is Lake like, Clementine in four? And I didn't, it just like, I looked at it and was like, moved on. So yeah, <laughs> that's totally region five. Okay. I wonder if like something got adjusted in my Excel as I was putting these in here. So um, no big deal. thank you for all of that. Take these with a grain of salt. And, well, and then the, the other thing I'm thinking is El Dorado. Do you guys have an El Dorado? Yeah, so there's okay. um, in Long Beach. Got it. There's El Dorado Park Lakes. Um, don't that's see I it would be easier to put an email just any notes and comments about some of these water bodies so yeah okay yeah, I'll right. just do that yeah thank you <laughs> thanks Emily uh Christina Christina hey hi sorry same thing there's an there's a lake that's not in our region region two I think yeah okay so, so I'll just, I'll I, think, I think my excel just got okay. messed up if I copied and pasted these in so I, my apologies for that, that. No so I'm wondering um Lori if if you send me a copy of your excel file and then we can put it on like a shared space and regional folks can make corrections that way you're not getting um three million emails <laughs> no uh, in my original data set i'm sure it's right it's just um in pre preparing these slides i probably just shifted something off so it won't be any problem to correct it and yes i can send you a copy of all of these slides i'll make these corrections and send it to you um, cool. so you can share yeah awesome thanks and kelly did you have a question uh, yeah, same thing too. And if you know, if you wanted to share the Latin longs with us too, then it, if you did want our our or our um, expertise of our region. But um, so my other, I do have. A, were you guys planning on getting all forty four of these water bodies with an advisory? And if so, like, what's the timeline on that? Or are you just was it like on your next slide where there was like five of them? Or I'm just curious because there are some that we're pretty interested in. Yeah, well, we'd love to hear, you know, what your priorities are. We typically do between nine and 12 a year. So these will remain on the list. We'll keep updating this list year by year. Um, okay. So, yeah, you know, we do place a lot of emphasis on stakeholder requests. So if you do have any, we'd love to hear them and we can, you know, if if we have a lot of water bodies that have an equal score and we have a stakeholder that has requested one, we'll bump that up. So, you know, we definitely, you know, love to hear what your thoughts are. Okay. So we could just follow up maybe once the list is updated, like mm -hmm. with our region, and then we could follow up with our requests of what's important to us, to yeah. you. Yeah, okay. That'd be great. Thanks, Kelly. Any other questions? Well, my email. Oh, yeah, Lori, I do have a question. I'm wondering if um, 
you know, these days with concern about uh, um, environmental justice and equity, if 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 a higher priority should be placed on that criterion, I'd be curious to, to know which one which water bodies score high on that criterion. Mm-hmm. Have you okay. have you guys thought about that? Um, you know, currently it has an equal as 25% of the score, just like all the other ones. Um, but one of the things that we did to capture higher CES areas is do 50 to 100. So if it has a CES score of over 50, it's a high priority. So, you know, something we could consider doing is, is lowering that. So more water bodies are assigned a higher priority, you know, if they reach 25 or higher. So, you know, things like that are on the table, but we currently use 50 to 100. Yeah, and it's yeah. also something that the regional reps can look at, you know, for their regions, if there are sort of priority water bodies from that perspective. Yeah, that's definitely something we would be interested. You know, we don't have the local knowledge being here in Sacramento, so we do rely on people to let us know, you know, if there's a water body that has a high fishing pressure and, you know, is used by a lot of subsistence fishers, we'd love to know that, you know. I wonder if, like, we could use this space to get you that information, <laughs> um, you know, just like we tell people to send us requests for water bodies for our monitoring. It, I think this is also a great space for us to, like annually, you mm. could give a presentation like this and we could give our consolidated <laughs> um, thoughts. Is that mm -hmm. something you might be interested in? Would that be helpful for y'all or? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're always open to hearing feedback and, um, you know, regional concerns, absolutely. That that uh, we have had we have give this presentation mm -hmm. uh, periodically. That that was the idea behind this. Um, yeah, it's been a, a couple years, I think. Yeah. You know, we'd be happy to do this on an annual basis. You know, the list refreshes every year, so um, you know that's something we could go over every year with water bodies assigned to the correct regions <laughs> and have that full discussion in the meeting. So, yeah, that, yeah, that would be great. great. Yeah. Yeah, because that way it stays on top of everybody's minds and we can do it in the moment rather than hoping it stays on the radar. Awesome. I'll um, circle back just as an action item. I'll circle back with you, Lori, to figure out like, you know, timelines. We don't want to give give your, give us, uh, give you our feedback, you know, a week before you're ready to make the decision so we can like plan ahead and yeah. figure out when the right meeting is. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, well, we're catching up a little bit. Get the screen sharing going here. All right, so now we will unveil some <laughs> the latest round of data from the Bass Lake project. So as a reminder, um, I'm starting with the, the, the biggest take home message at the beginning here this time. So this is the existing uh, graph of the statewide mean black bass mercury uh, length adjusted. Um, and the, the, the first round of sampling, we got a, a statewide mean of 0.3, and then the next two rounds were, were higher. And um, doing some preliminary thinking about what might be behind that. Um, I've talked about the influence of, of water levels and uh, water level fluctuation in reservoirs as being an important factor and noted that the first round of sampling was towards the end of a multi-year drought, a five-year drought. We were in the fourth year of the drought at that point in 2015. <clears throat> and then 
2017 and 2019 were were uh, wetter years. So a plausible hypothesis was that um, that the you know water year might correlate with the the fluctuation that we saw from the first year to the next couple of years. Um, and then just as more sort of climate background on the this 2021 sampling year. Well, and then, I'm sorry, and 2021 was another uh, year of intense drought. So a good test of that simple hypothesis of the simple relationship to water year. Um, but going along with the, the drought in 2021 and 2020, um, we were in the middle of the apocalypse and had 4 million acres of, uh, burned in 2020 and then another large amount in 2021. So I'm mainly listing this because it affected <clears throat> our ability to access a few of the lakes. Um, so the, the number of lakes that we were able to sample was a little bit lower because we they were um, a few of them were in areas that were burned or burning. Um, <clears throat> and then these years were, were very high in 2022. There was a big drop. I don't have the exact acreage number, but it was 85% lower than uh, 2021. So what do we see in 2021 for the statewide mean? Drum roll, please. Um, the concentrations, the hypothesis does not hold up. The concentrations were not lower. So that simple hypothesis of wet year, dry year, uh, drought or non-drought, you know, the, it's not that simple. The statewide mean in 2021 was very, very similar to the statewide mean in 2019 and uh, slightly higher. So the highest that, you know, by a little bit, the highest that we've seen so far. So let's take a closer look at the data. Um, this looks. Different. It's the same information. I just. Oh, you cleaned it up. I yeah. see. <laughs> I made okay. it bigger. <laughs> me, no give, me a, give me a second to digest it. <laughs> <laughs> I do sneak uh, attacks on Jay. I'll like make his slide <laughs> slightly different to throw him off. <laughs> it, lo <laughs> it looks. It looks better. Um, so, uh, comparing to 2019. So this is a more detailed breakdown. The mean was slightly higher, but basically the same as 2019. This is again for just the random lakes. We also sample um, some special request lakes. Sometimes we sample lakes that were from previous panels. So this is just the random lakes from panel four. The median was similar. Standard deviation was similar. The 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 count was much lower, and so the standard error, which is uh, re related to the to the um, to the n was a little higher, so the error bars were a little higher for the mean. Um, and the reason that the count was lower, um, some lakes that were in panel four were actually sampled in 2019. Is part of uh, um, a lot of them were in region four, and we uh, region four wanted them sampled earlier. Some lakes had low water levels, and so there were access issues. Other lakes had access limited by wildfire. And then um, every year there are a few lakes where this, uh, this is based on the um, length adjusted data. And uh, there are always some lakes where we're not, we can't, we don't get a significant regression. And so we don't do the length adjustment. We just um, take the, uh, take a, a straight mean of the fish that are of legal size. So there are a number of factors as to why the N was lower in 2021. Um, the count of lakes that were over point, the 0 0.2 part per million statewide objective for, um, for, for bass is sent very similar, 76% in 2019, 80% in 2021. So Overall, the, the data for 2021 look very similar. In 2019, um, our simple hypothesis is not good enough to explain 
what's going on at the statewide level. Um, <clears throat> so taking a closer look at the data, um, this is always my favorite graph for the largemouth bass data, uh, which is the bulk of, you know, this is bass lake monitoring. This is the, the bulk of the data that we're generating, mercury and individual fish from each lake. Um, and I just like seeing the overall spread of the data versus length. Um, you can see the, the, the you know, maximum concentrations for individual fish getting up to around two and a half parts per million. But at the low end, we're, we're down near the detection limit or around 0.01 parts per million. Um, and I'm going to show a couple graphs that kind of spread things out a little more so you can look at the, look at the data for each individual lake. Um, there were a couple of lakes in Region 2 where Kerry Austin wanted us to do individuals uh, on small fish. Um, so this is something unusual, you know, they, but these clusters um, show up there. And then you can kind of see which, you know, which lakes, uh, you, there's a general tendency for there to be a uh, pretty obvious relationship with length. Um, like Sula Julie Lake, it was the hottest one this year. These pink diamonds um, show the high end of the range. Uh, and then there are several lakes down here with, with lower levels, um, but I'll kind of break those out a little more in, in the next slides. And then this 350 millimeter line, this is the length that we adjust to. So basically doing a regression for each lake on the points and figuring out where the line sits and and then using that line to estimate the concentration at 350 millimeters. Um, so breaking these uh, this graph into two sets so you can see the individual plots a little more clearly. Um, the the lake with uh, Another lake with relatively high concentrations was Amador in Region 5 in the Sierra Foothills. These kind of hatched diamonds. Um, so you can see that you can eyeball a regression line that would put Amador at about one part per million. Um, there's a Bay Area lake here that's got relatively low levels, um, Lafayette Reservoir. Uh, these asterisks, um, Lake Wolford, uh, I think it's in Southern California, it was at the bottom here, so very low slope, low in a low concentration in bass. <clears throat> um, so Sula Julie again is the, the lake that stood out this year, and uh, if you eyeball a line through through these points, well, actually, we you know you can see that it would it would intersect this 350 millimeter line at around here. Uh, so this this is uh, relatively high concentration compared to the overall data set for that we have for length adjusted largemouth bass in the state. Okay, um, we also look at other black bass species this year. For this round, we got spotted bass in some lakes um, and no smallmouth, um, but we see similar patterns. Um, New Bullard's Bar had relatively high levels. The, the mean comes out at around 1.0. 1, 1 um, Big Bear Lake, in contrast, at the other end, concentration at about 0 0.4, 0 0.3. Um, and then in, in contrast, rainbow trout, usually don't show any relationship with length is beautifully illustrated here. Just a flat, flat lines, um, no, no relationship with length because the fish are not really reflective of the food webs in the water bodies that they're, that they're caught from. And this isn't always the case. Sometimes the, the uh, trout do, do start, um, uh, feeding on the local food web and reflecting it, but 
Uh, usually there's no relationship. Okay, so um, I'm, I've just started working up the data. I don't have this graph updated for 2021 yet, but just to place Sula Julie in context, its concentration was up in this range with these highest values that we've seen in the statewide data set. And uh, New Bullard's Bar was in this range, which is still in the, uh, probably in the top 10% of lakes overall. So relatively high concentrations in a couple of the, the lakes that we sampled in 2021. Um, so a little, I've done a, a very small, quick amount of uh, digging on, into information on Sula Julie. And it's a reservoir that um, actually was is relatively recent. It was, um, uh, and now I'm not remembering for sure the date, but uh, I think it was, um, not sure if it was 1990 or 1970 that the the, the dam was uh, built and the reservoir formed, uh, but relatively recent. And there are a number of mine sites on this reservoir. And um, it's been studied uh, pretty intensively. Um, this, there was a, I found a report by Brown and Caldwell that was looking at options for remediation. Um, but we um, sampled the uh, swamp sampled this reservoir in 2007 and found a concentration length adjusted of around 0.9. Uh, this this round is at about 1.8, so um, much higher. It's um, kind of unusual that the levels fluctuate that much over time. Uh, overall. When we re revisit lakes, they're surprisingly consistent from you know over time. So uh, I don't know if remediation is begun in, at this reservoir, but if it has, it's not working. Um, does anybody know anything about this reservoir? As Region Two, I should know more, but I I don't. <laughs> that was that was Carrie's thing. But yeah. I, I'm going to start having our our new Mercury person attend these meetings. Who should right. know more than I do? And yeah. I'm not even sure if I'm saying the name right. Do you it, know? It's that? Sula Huli. Sula Huli. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But I know they have they have aerators that they're using downstream um, to stop methyl mercury methyl mercury for the the steelhead and whatnot downstream. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what's happening in the in the reservoir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's my sort of quick uh, preliminary look at the mercury data. Um, we'll be uh, getting a report out to you all. Um, right now we're waiting. Uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, working out issues with AXIS, the organics lab, on submitting their data, and she's making progress there. So. Um, not going to um, be able to get the draft report written until we get the organics data and can include those data in our, our tables and in the report. So the approximate timeline is about a month after we get all the data, we'll um, get the draft report ready and out to the group. We can discuss it at the next stew meeting. And then after we get comments, um, we'll finalize it in about a month after that. So any any comments or questions on what you've seen? Autumn. Yeah, I just had a comment on, on the very first graph you showed. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've got the um, mean by year. Are you waiting until all five panels are done to compare them, like to put them all together to get the statewide, the true statewide average for what we've actually sampled? Or have you looked at that? Um, yes, and also th this um, brings up another point about reporting. So we're waiting to get the fifth panel, which will complete the whole set of around 190 bass lakes that, that we set out to sample. 
Um, and then um, once, once we have the data for that, I'll write an interpretive report that really tries to look at the variation at this level, but um, also looking at, at other, other uh, points of interest, um, like, you know, which particular uh, lakes are, are high and low. Um, one of the things I asked Colin about was variation within lakes, and we've collected multiple locations within lakes, and sometimes there is significant variation between locations within our larger lakes. So looking at things like that. So once we get the full set, we'll, um, I'll do a, you know, I haven't really, these are all data reports so far. I haven't really, you know, tried to dig into interpretation, um, but we'll definitely do that. And, you know, we'll have a, we'll have an, a mean of the entire group of 190 lakes and then be able to, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, uh, another hypothesis that's, a little more sophisticated that still might be able to explain the interannual variation that we see here. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, we caught up. Did so, um, yeah, we did get, catch up. The next meeting is scheduled for July 19th. As we've done, we'll adjust the uh time on the agenda. Um, so if we don't need the full three hours, uh, we can give you more of your day back. Um, note that with the new email list system. I don't have the ability to send folks calendar invitations, so I might, I, I haven't decided on um, enabling like registration for Zoom so folks can download the calendar invitation. I'm still considering that, but just know that um, if you have a calendar invite um, on your calendars, I won't be able to update it because I no longer have access in the same way I did before. So just heads up on that. Um, and we also talked about the monitoring council meeting um, on June 1. So heads up for that. And if you can go to the next slide, Jay. Um, we've already actually talked about a couple of items for the next meeting, but I'd love if folks have more ideas. Um, so hearing from the Bay RMP, um, on their PFAS fish data, that'd be great. And then, um, you know, having a, a discussion on the full draft uh, 2021 Bass Lakes data and report. I'm hoping by July we'll be able to go through the new web pages. Um, but if there's, and we'll also start talking about next year's sampling to kind of get those conversations going so we can get our permits in on time and all of that good stuff. But is there anything else that folks want to hear about potentially in July? Or ideas for guest speakers? Yeah. And um, if nothing's coming up for you now, that's okay. Um, there's a standing action item for y'all to email me <laughs> if you have those ideas. Um, yeah, so we can just, if you kind of go to the next slides, we'll just walk through action items. Um, there isn't anything here because we didn't have a break, so I wasn't able to sneak in. Um, I didn't hear any action items for um, Colin's awesome um, presentation other than to keep a lookout for upcoming reports and things like that that should be starting to come out in the next year. Um, I didn't hear anything for quick updates. For OEHA, um, OEHA's presentation, Lori will share the slides and the water body list with, uh, with me and I'll distribute, distribute them uh, with uh, meeting summaries and things like that. And then if the regional board folks can just take a look and provide feedback, I'll develop a system to do that in an easy, consistent way. Um, and I'll also circle back with Lori to um, coordinate future uh, priority conversations 
um, in future annual meetings. And then Jay and I will distribute the report to the student email list for review as soon as it's ready. <laughs> um, was there anything else that I missed for those items? Okay, great. Um, and then again, standing action items. I'm gonna work, be working on the um, you know, meeting notes and the recording and we'll get that shared hopefully next week. Um, it might be a little bit later, but we'll get that out as soon as possible. And I'll send an email letting y'all know when that's ready. And then um, there's that item. Uh, feel free to email me or, or Jay if you have um, meeting, speaker ideas um, or anything like that. And I think that's it, unless um, someone else captured something that I didn't. Autumn? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that the um, October meeting overlaps with the Swamp Roundtable. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what the plans are for that. Yeah, we might need to shift the October meeting. Um, I'm working working on that. October is still a little, a teeny ways away, so we've got time. But yeah, it's um, I'm aware of that, and we're thinking about solutions there. So heads up for that, and we'll make a decision before the July meeting, so everyone kind of um, is informed well before the October meeting date. Thanks, Adam. All right. Well, with that. Um, Jay Bardo and I wish you a great week. If you go to the next slide, Jay, um, and we'll see y'all in July and take good care. Thanks for coming. And try not to bioaccumulate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.